Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kangxin Wu, and I'm a fifth year architecture student. Um, my studio is over that corner on the third floor. So if anyone has further questions about the fellowship, you can just come and ask me at the studio. It's like I'm sitting at the very end. So um, so this presentation, I'm going to talk about my summer experiences with the David Schwartz Fellowship. This is a photo, uh, a, pic a picture of um, all the summer interns. This summer, we are all from different universities. So um, the firm is around 20 to 30 people in total. And um, because this summer, they got lots of big projects going up. So they hired a lot of new people. So there are, besides um, these, um, our interns, there are, all, uh, there are also many full-time students coming. So this summer, I had great conversations with people from all kinds of places and all, age, all ages. It was a fun experience. So I'm going to first talk about the individual research because that's a very important part of the application. Um, for my research, I, what I did is the evolution of Japanese gardens from landscape design to architecture component. Um, so for the, re, the, the internship and research goes like this. The research was around two weeks usually, and then there's the 10 week internship. The firm is really flexible um, whether you want to start the research first or the internship first. Um, so I choose to start the research first because um, well, I went to Japan at May. The weather is better because I'm going to lots of gardens which are exterior spaces. And also there are some gardens which are only open in May and some gardens needs like one or two months um, reservation. So if people are planning for their research, I would really recommend people to look really into the itinerary and see if you want to um, which one, is for, uh, which one is better for you going first or going later. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my research. This is the places I went around Japan. So the garden architecture is a really, um, one of my personal interests that I hold for a long time. I come from China and I was interested in Chinese garden architecture for a long time, which also developed into my thesis project with Professor Stamper. Um, also, um, the Italian villa also gave me lots of ins inspirations. That's why I kind of developed this idea of going to Japan and study the Japanese garden. And what I focused on was especially its relationship with the building. So how um, the building spaces and garden spaces can connect into each other and um, function as a whole. Um, for this trip, I went to a lot of smaller places in Japan, which are uh, more have, have more Asian towns. So they have um, the uh, old Japanese gardens preserved. But I also went to some uh, contemporary buildings and see how the Japanese ar architects right now learn from the garden aesthetics and use in their own architecture design. These are some pictures of the um, gardens I went to, and um, I was particularly looking at how um, Japanese gardens use views to um, let the garden features, which are exterior components, into the interior design. So usually, the, in the Japanese gar traditional Japanese gardens, the building is more um, modest, it's not about a grand facade, but about the experience when you're sitting inside the building and you can um, have a very nice frame view of the garden. And that's also related to their tradition of the, um, like the Japanese tea ceremony and the Zen um, tradition. So all of this linked together, I looked at different garden spaces and um, experienced how the um, garden area it can be um, it can be reflected in when you are inside the buildings. 
And at that corner, that's me <laughs> trying to mimic a stone in the garden. <laughs> and then further on, I went to see some of the contemporary buildings. And um, I also look at how they use sometimes um, existing garden features or sometimes created um, like smaller garden courtyards to um, also combine the garden into the building design. I went to many museums, um, hotels, and shops by um, famous architects such as An um, Anno Tadao and uh, uh, Kengo Kuma and all of the um, famous Japanese architects. And I studied their plans, their um, how, how each component of the building have um, views towards the gardens. Um, but I didn't um, include many of the other informations of the research here because of the limited time. If any of you are interested in the Japanese garden, just come talk to me and I have lots of more experiences that, that I can share with you. But right now I'm going to continue and talk a little bit about the internship experiences. Um, that's the 10 weeks in uh, Washington DC and that's like the most part of my summer. Uh, for the internship, I really tried a lot of different tasks. So um, actually, the, we, we are um, many, diff, um, we are like, there was seven uh, interns together, but we have different teams and we are divided into different teams. So a friend of mine, like Brenna, she um, focused on the Vanderbilt project, which is a long um, ongoing project. Uh, the firm built uh, one dorm for the Vanderbilt and they are um, currently building two more new dorms. So that's a very big project. And she was in the team for the whole um, 10 weeks. Um, but I was kind of jumping through different teams. So at first I worked on um, the firm monograph for a week. And then I went to, the, I went to work with Michael for a uh, Charleston apartment competition. And then later I, I worked with Ted for a, a Guanahani hotel project. The reason that I uh, jumped through different teams is that first I want really in a, like really experience the different uh, components of a real working environment. And also like we all have different strengths. So for me, um, to be honest, I'm not very good at Revit, but I'm willing, uh, I'm confident with CAD, uh, Photoshop, and um, hand drawings and all the other um, techniques. So um, really, uh, it's important that you would know some of the computer techniques, but that's not all of it. So you just need to tell the firm what you are strong at, and then uh, the firm will help you to find a place that can utilize your abilities better. Some of the interesting um, components of the internship I did was, um, for example, doing a physical model with the phones. This is a part that I think is lacking in our university education. So I was really um, happy to learn that with some of the small tools, you can really twist the phone board and make it really a clean cut, and especially when cutting curves and making edges. So that's also very useful for my future, um, future um, model making experiences. So this is a, actually an interior um, project for a New York apartment. The firm really has a wide range of different projects that's going on. So I feel like if people uh, get the fellowship and work at the firm. It's really important to talk uh, about what you really want to do. So this is another very interesting um, part that I did. This is a um, rendering with marker and color pencil. And it's, a, it's actually the first time I used this technique to draw. And <laughs> I personally is really uh, satisfied with the result. So um, the master of rendering, <laughs> really the master of rendering, Jeffrey, he's called, and he told me all the little tricks of using marker and pencil and how to create a vivid effect on the drawings. 
And I think this technique really um, is useful for even my future studio designs. So I used this drawing for some of my projects for um, pro uh, perspectives, especially. So um, really, um, I, I feel like uh, doing different parts of the um, projects and trying to uh, involve in different parts of the tasks can uh, let me learn lots of things that I haven't learned in school. And sometimes it's often useful for uh, future studio projects. Uh, well, I'm not saying that staying in one project is not good because uh, the Vanderbilt project, for example, is a really big project. And I do feel that people can learn a lot from it. Um, so it all depends on how you want to learn and how it's better for you to uh, absorb the knowledge from the um, internship experiences. And <laughs> there are also some firm activities that's going on. And <laughs> that's Mataya. <laughs> She's going to talk <laughs> next. Um, <laughs> so uh, in the summer, every um, Friday, almost every Friday, there are like happy hours. And, um, and, and like two times a week or even more uh, during the lunch time, there will be lunch and learn activities and also some um, games going on that um, you can just go there and sometimes there are food and uh, sometimes like the firms who's doing uh, lighting or material will come and give lectures. So all these um, other activities are also very helpful for um, knowing what's going on in the working environment. And lastly, because um, I stayed 10 weeks in DC and I really, really like the city. Uh, so I really want to say that, um, although I know like every fourth year, the school takes us to DC to see the, um, the major buildings, but I feel like living in DC really see the difference because there are a lot of nice smaller spaces that cannot be um, enjoyed when you are just looking at the bigger structures. So if you have the chance, just go there and enjoy the summer. That's like a really, really nice summer that I had. Okay, so next, Mataya will talk um, more about the research experiences and help you with the applications. I think I have a question. Oh, oh, first, question. is there any questions for me? If not, I will let Mataya talk first and then we can discuss together. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, my name is Mataya Talahun. I am a third year graduate student. Um, and my presentation is actually going to be very different. I'm going really um, in detail about my, my research. Um, good of Katsing to have um, talked uh, a lot about the internship. So you already know all the information that you need. Um, about the internship and living in DC and um, the experience in general. But um, I am actually going to talk about my, my research and I will um, apologize. It's actually going to be very long, so <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize how long it is until now. Um, so for those of you who do not know, um, I was born and raised in Ethiopia, um, Addis Ababa. It's the capital city of Ethiopia. I was really a nice place to grow up in the 90s. It was fairly urban, um, but I also grew up in a very um, nice uh, small neighborhood. So I kind of had the, both, the best of both worlds. Um, but in the past 20 years, the population has actually skyrocketed. It has actually doubled. So um, I moved here about um, 2010. So when I went back, um, after 10 years, so you can imagine um, the, the chaos and, and, and the dismay that I, I received. And I kind of really didn't really recognize the city that I grew up in. And, and it is very chaotic. And I'm going to show you a quick little video of how chaotic it is. <laughs> and this is just on a normal Tuesday afternoon. Um, so... 
just kind of like pay attention to the people that are like crossing the street right here. They like really do not care. No cares were given on that day. Yeah. So this was this is a video actually that was made um, in 2014, I think. So right now it's maybe 10 times worse than what you're looking at. Um, so yeah, this is what I had to deal with when I went back. This is called Mescal Square. Actually, this is the biggest square in um, Addis and also the whole country. Um, and this kind of brings me to the objective of the whole research. I wanted to really understand the urban structure of um, the city and also other cities. Um, but that was too broad, so I kind of really focused on this, just the civic structure and what kind of form and what types of civic structures that exist um, in Ethiopia. Um, while looking at civic, the civic realm, um, it really came down to identifying the forms that the, the civic spaces take on in the context of Ethiopian urbanism and really understanding that these forms don't necessarily look like um, the forms that we're used to in the Greco-Roman um, Western context, like squares, piazzas, largos, etc. Um, so uh, we're going to look at that, but really quickly I'm going to do a rundown of my internships and the city that, cities that I've visited. Um, I did my internship first in D.C., I'm not going to go into detail about it because Katsink has kind of um, covered all of that. Um, I went to Ethiopia. Um, in Ethiopia, I visited three cities, Addis Ababa, Gonder, and Bahardar. And then um, at the end of last semester, in the fall semester, I was able to go to London. Um, this presentation is not actually uh, organized in the, uh, in the order of my travel. Um, it's just going to be organized based on the, um, the information that I would like to present. We're going to start with Bahardar. Um, and Bahardar literally means um, lakefront. So it is located um, right here in the southernmost tip of Lake Tana. And Lake Tana is actually the lake that the Blue Nile starts from, so all the way to Egypt. Um, and just to get a sense of the, the scale, I have Rome here. Um, many of you, most of you know Rome or will know Rome soon. You'll see Rome a lot in this presentation. I miss Rome a lot. Um, and we can fit the, the historic center of Rome um, snugly in um, Bahardar. So it's a very comparable um, size of um, the city. And Ethiopia is also a very religious and very conservative um, country. So most of these civic structures that I'm going to be talking about is going to revolve a lot around um, religious uh, holidays and um, religious um, affiliations of sorts. Um, and as you can see, most the majority of the, um, the population adheres to a Coptic um, Orthodox Christian. There are um, almost the same amount of Muslims, so it's kind of like a, a shared uh, country, so that's, that's really good. Um, especially for Bahardar. Bahardar is actually known for its monasteries. It has one of the oldest monasteries in the country. Um, and they are kind of scattered around the islands and also around the peninsula. Um, but the closest ones that um, that the closest ones to the the mainland were these two right here, um, and I was able to go to this one because the other one was um, only uh, allowed for men. Um, so. I went to this one. This one is actually the oldest one. I think it dates back to the ninth century, according to the historians um, on, on the island. Um, this one is called um, Nagra Selase, um, and the original structure was built in the 13th century and then later reconstructed by Empress Mintuwab in the um, 18th century. Um, this is also according to the historians um, on the island. They do have their own um, their own historians that live on the island that keep 
track of all of the texts and all of the historic references that have anything to do with um, these um, monasteries. Um, you can kind of see it as you approach the island, you can see the monastery, um, but once you arrive, um, you kind of have to ascend, um, go up the stairs, and then kind of make a, a right turn to get to the monastery. Um, and then when you arrive, um, you can kind of see the structure. Um, this kind of reminds me of like a, a, a Tholos type. And oops. Yeah. So it, it kind of reminds me of a Tholos type, which um, all of this um, outer porch is um, on the outside. And it's, uh, not co it's covered, but it is on the outside. So one can cir circumambulate the whole um, structure. And I just put a reference for um, the typology right there. Um, and this is a, a rough sketch of what the um, plan would look like. And the, the Holy of Holies would obviously be centered, um, would obvi obviously be centered, and then one would be able to circumambulate. And that would be closely related, even in plan, to the Tholos type. Um, the interior would be also covered with murals. Um, these murals are said to have um, stories of Greek martyrs, so you can kind of see like the correlation of how this kind of structure was um, um, is being built um, in Ethiopia. And if any of you do know, like the Greek Orthodox and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church are very much um, linked together, so. There is a lot of like cultural um, shifts and um, learning from um, each other's cultures. And then once we get um, back to the mainland, this right here is called Mesca Square. Um, you will hear this this term a lot because in every city, a giant um, just space that's not really a square is called Mesca Square in every city. So apparently that's what it's called. Um, but I, I had to like add this on here because there's not really any other civic space in the city that I could, um, I could find. But for c comparison, I added um, uh, Piazza Navona at the same scale. And it is about the same size if we kind of rearrange um, the area. Uh, but again, it's not really that welcoming and no one really uses it unless there is a big holiday or a festival happening. Um, and this view is right here looking in. And you will find that, again, this is going to be a repetitive theme. Um, everything is walled. And um, that's like one of the things I really want to understand why everything is walled. This is a, a square, it's supposed to be a public square, but it's walled and it's not um, available for public use unless for ex uh, specific holidays. Um, and then we have another um, monastery. Again, the idea of the monastery being atop the hill um, uh, reinforces that idea that you ha one has to ascend to, to get to um, the higher place, which is um, the church and a higher... Um, knowing of God, I think. And then we go to Gondar, uh, which is about 100 and 143 um, kilometers um, north of Bahrada. Um This city used to be the capital city of Ethiopia back in, starting from, um, let's see, 1636, and that happened when the Emperor Facilitas built his castle and kind of just proclaimed that Gondor is going to be the capital city. Um, and this ha the Gondor kept being the capital city up until another emperor in Addis, which is the capital right now, built another castle and then proclaimed that that now is the, the capital city. Um, again, I have uh, Rome here for reference. Um, it's fairly com comparable. Um, it, it's a small city, so it, it should be um, fairly 
uh, comfortable. Um, in Gondar, we have a plethora of churches. This is just within, this is just within the small um, inner circle. Um, and these are only the main churches. There's still like a lot more of the smaller churches probably every, at every corner. And we're going to look at this guy and this guy right here. Um, so this one is located um, at the highest point in the city. Um, it actually looks more like a fortress, and this is because at the time that this was um, built, um, Gondor was, the city was um, going through a constant attack from the Darvishes from um, Sudan. So churches and the, um, uh, the castles had to be built like fortresses to be able to uh, defend themselves from attacks from uh, foreign uh, powers. Um, and as you enter, you look at the front facade. And kind of the same way as um, you saw in earlier uh, monastery, it's kind of, it is open all throughout. Um, you can go all the way through and circumambulate the, the structure. Um, and you also see these towers that um, there's 12 of them for the 12 apostles. So these are the towers that would um, be surrounding the structure for protection. Um, and again, with that. So this is a little um, sketch of the plan. Um, and once I did that, it kind of dawned on me that it had similarities with the Temple of Solomon. And um, the Temple of Sol well, Solomon and Ethiopia has a long running um, history because Queen Sheba and Solomon are said to have had um, a child that later became the ruler of Ethiopia. So it's interesting to see that these kind of structural um, similarities exist. Maybe that is where they found um, the inspiration to create this kind of structures. Um, this is also another example of um, like a Tholos type church. And we're going to go through it really quickly because it's pretty much the same thing. Again, it's circular. Um, you have the ascension, um, there's uh, an elevational difference from the street all the way up to the church, and it's um, the main structure is always centered. Um, then we're going to the Fasil Gibi, which is the, um, the uh, complex of castles that was made by the Emperor Fasilidis when they decided that Ethiopia, um, uh, Gondor was going to be the uh, capital of Ethiopia. I'm just going to show quick pictures of what they look like. Um, these are medieval castles, very um, cool looking. They just remind me of, you know, like old medieval castles. And it was um, a lot of fun just going through um, the ruins. And um, some of them like are fully intact and you can go inside. Um, but yeah. And then we have the summer palace of facilities and the baths. This is actually by far my favorite building. Um, this is the only structure that still survives from the complex of the baths. Um, and this was kind of a, a ceremonial building. Um, this right here would be um, flooded with water. Water would be taken from the nearby river and then drained back into the river. And then you also have um, bleachers for observers actually um, even till today, it's used for um, uh, ceremonies like Epiphany and things like that. And then the trees also join in on the fun. Um, and then around the facilities, we have a bunch of other civic uh, buildings. We have the um, city hall right here, a public park, uh, a bunch of other um, uh, churches, but still the public spaces are still lacking. So that's kind of like what interests me and um, wanted to go and see. Um, in the park, you would see people kind of just hanging out and drinking coffee like that. Um, this is just a very normal thing to happen. Um, this is because coffee is actually a very, very important part of Ethiopian culture. I don't know if any of you know this, but coffee is actually originated in Ethiopia. Um, 
so it's an entire ritual. It's not just like, go, let's make coffee and, and drink it. So you do everything from scratch, um, from like the raw beans, um, roast the beans, crush the beans and brew the beans and everything. So it becomes an entire culture. So um, these kind of um, places and spaces that people kind of like do a makeshift area of, um, they're not provided by the city. Um, they're not planned into the city structure. Um, so it kind of like got me to think that while proposing any kind of um, urban intervention, knowing that people would like to have these kind of structures um, is, I think, important. And so, um, so just providing them with the space um, to do these activities. Um, and these are more pictures of churches because there's a lot of them. And this is the um, Saturday market. Um, this was taken on a not Saturday, so it was really not that interesting. But as you can imagine, on Saturdays, it would actually be um, filled up. And then we go to the second Mescal Square, um, which is very dismal. This, they call this a square, but it's really just a, an open space that is really undefined. Um, doesn't necessarily have any boundaries. It's just there. There's a plaza being created right now. Uh, it's under construction, but it's still a very like not pleasant place to be. Um, and those are so um, I just like have a quick comparison. This Mezcal Square is actually almost the same size as the Piazza de la Rotonda. And as you can see from the images, they, it looks so much bigger than the Piazza de la Rotonda. And that's because it's not um, well built or um, it's not contained as well as um, it is. And there's no commercial activities or anything like that. So um, that's something to be learned from. Um, there's also another small square. This one is done by the Italians. Um, and these are the 1930s Italian buildings that are plaguing the city of Gondar. Um, as you can see, this square right here, it's supposed to be a square that's right there. Um, it's completely empty. No one really uses it. Um, and that's because it's not defined, cars can go through it, it's not shaded, um, it doesn't have any pavement um, delineation, so again, that's just really noticing um, the differences uh, that small little things would make. So if we shaded this place, it could have probably been able to be used. Then we come to Addis Ababa, which is the capital city. Um, it is actually huge, you can fit nine rooms in there. Um, and obviously did not do the whole um, cellular growth and, and all that. Um, we're going to look at two churches, um, and these are the axes that make up the square fronting the churches, um, and right here is the equestrian um, statue of uh, Emperor Menelik, and that kind of directs you to the church and it's kind of like a straight shot through. Again, you see like this, this structure is like repeated over and over and over again, this idea of the tholos where you enter and then you ascend um, to get to the church structure. And then we are looking at um, Holy Trinity Cathedral. This is actually a Roman cathedral, so that's different. Um, there's not a lot of... Um, Catholics in Ethiopia. So this is a tad different. Um, so this one is also a, a, a linear axis through. You um, have a straight shot through um, to look at the church. Um, excuse the pictures. It was pouring rain the day I, uh, I visited here. But um, I thought this was um, an interesting architectural uh, piece because it's uh, very different than um, the rest of the churches that we looked at, but structurally speaking, it is the same. It is centered on the whole compound, and there is a platform, and you have to ascend to get to it. 
Um, and then now we're looking at this giant sequence, which the Holy Trinity is kind of at the beginning of. Um, for comparison, I added the um, sequence from uh, on um, Via Foro Imperiali, starting from um, uh, the monument of uh, Vittorio Emanuele to the Colosseo. And I know um, some of you have walked through this, and it's absolutely horrible. And this is that tiny little thing compared to this monster. So, um, yeah, again, it's for comparison. And this analysis is really kind of looking at the scale of things and this just insane scale that no one really like thinks about how to make it, um, bring it down to a human scale. Uh, and in the sequence, there's really nothing that's interesting except for this giant wall that um, that holds this public square. This is supposed to be a public square, but um, it's walled and no one really uses it because there's a giant avenue that passes through it. Um, And then we're back at the Mescal Square. That's where we um, started. You can actually fit two coliseums in the whole square. Um, and I think that's really ter terrible. Um, and you can also fit three pantheons in this public park right here. Um, and we have an image of what this giant square looks like and it's really terrifying and I don't even know why they call it a square and then we're back at this lovely um, video of um, this is taken um, across the across from the square and and this is just this is just normal I guess this is what normal looks like um, in Ethiopia um, but I really like wanted to understand like why it it why this is the way it is. So I went to London. Um, I know London doesn't really seem like where you find answers about Ethiopia. But um, so Sir Patrick Abercrombie, who did the master plan of London in um, 19, 1940, 19, 1997, um, actually also did the master plan of um, Addis Ababa. So here is um, Sir Patrick, this is this guy right here, um, presenting his master plan of the Greater London um, to um, the committee. And here is him presenting the master plan of Ad Saba to the emperor um, at the time. And this is done, like, this is within a couple of years of each other. And... Um, this, like, the reason why I went to London was really to be able to find this book, and I did find it in uh, the RIBA library. Um, and then we also have a comparison of um, Addis Ababa and its plan, um, the way that Sir Patrick kind of explained it and how he um, wanted to organize it. And he organized them both using three rings, um, each of them kind of... Um, smaller than the, the other one, um, and then with streets that radiate out. So they, he calls it the three rings and the radials. So both of them are kind of organized um, based on this structure. Um, but obviously, from what we've seen, the, um, the way that they were uh, made is two completely different things, and that's kind of like my research going forward. Uh, going forward is finding out really why um, the, the way it is and the, the structure that Ethiopian urbanism has taken is um, the way it is right now. And I will leave you with this lovely little image of the railway station, which may or might not have been destroyed recently. And um, thank you. If you have any questions, please let me know.